Hello and welcome to our online service here at Compass Community Church. My name is Andy and it is my privilege to be your host this morning. This past week I was able to attend a leadership development conference and it was a great time to meet some new friends and learn some great biblical truths and just spend time unplugged for a couple of days. But you know what was really great about it? Being in community, being together and finding that recharge, that encouragement and inspiration that you find when you're in a group like that. Throughout our All In series, we've been talking about our core values here at Compass. What are things that we prioritize as a church as we walk together in faith? So far, we've highlighted our core values like relentless prayer and passionate worship and biblical teaching. And today, we are reminded that one of the values that we hold highly is the crucial value of practical care. You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it tells us that although we are all unique and diverse in terms of our backgrounds, gifts, and personalities, the church functions best and glorifies Jesus the most as we come together as different parts to form one body. We aren't an organization, we're a family, and families take care of each other. Jesus said the world would know that we are his by our love. And as we submit and support and pray and care for each other in practical ways, we demonstrate the love of God to a world that needs to experience his love and his saving power. This happens in and through community community that you can find here at Compass. Consider this your personal invitation from me to you to join us as we experience community here. We are created by a relational God, and that means he made us to have a relationship with him and with others. We're not meant to go it alone. We see this in example of Jesus, that he chose 12 others to journey with him through life. Here's the thing. When you connect relationally, you thrive spiritually. The two are connected. So be brave, take a risk, and accept this invitation to be part of Compass Group Life. Whether you've been following Jesus for years or maybe you're just hearing about Jesus now, there is a place for you. You can easily find out about all, our, all of our ministries here at Orangeville. All that are starting back up are Compass Kids and Students, Compass Men and Women and Senior Adults, even Compass Sports. The list is quite long, but here's a few that we want to highlight for you today. Right off the top, Compass Men is back, and this fall they're diving into a six-week study into the book of Galatians. Why only six weeks? Because we know how life is, and we're not asking you to commit to the next year, but only for six weeks. So why not consider coming out and meeting other guys, other men, and learning and growing and praying together in community? You can find out all the, all the information you need on our website. Over the last five years through our Freedom Session ministry, we have witnessed this beautiful transformation of many in our church family. Freedom Session is a healing and discipleship program for anyone who is ready to rise above past hurts and unhealthy habits to embrace the purposes for which God created them. And so on October 5th, there is a informal, no obligation information night here at the Orangeville site. Here, you're gonna be able to meet the team and ask any questions that you might have. You know, we all have stories, and this is your invitation to rewrite your story with a God-inspired ending. Maybe you're there and you're thinking, I love to get connected and meet with people, but I have no idea how. I know that this is harder to do if you're new to the area or even new to Compass. We think the best way to do that is to join a home group. Home groups are a place that you can hang out and have fun and grow in your relationship with Jesus with others. We want to invite you to come to our group launch on Sunday, October the 16th. If you're interested in meeting new people for the purpose of forming a home group, simply visit the website and reserve your spot today. Life is a whole lot better when you're connected. When you connect with others relationally, it provides an opportunity for you to thrive spiritually. But how do you make new friends, especially if you're new to the area or the church? We think the best way is to join a home group. Being a part of a Compass home group means you'll meet regularly with a small group of people to hang out, have fun, and grow in your relationship with Jesus. The hard thing about groups, though, is finding one that's right for you. That's why we created Group Launch. Group Launch is an event that walks you through the process of forming a home group. You'll find that we try to make it as simple as possible to meet new people while removing the awkwardness of having to start the conversation yourself. All you have to do is reserve a spot online and show up. When you arrive, we connect you with people who are in the same stage of life or live in your area of town. From there, you'll be free to chat with everyone and then, through some guided conversations, decide who you'd like to form a group with. Our group launch team will be on hand to help you every step of the way. 
visit our website to reserve your spot and we'll see you there.
Majestic is your name in all the earth.
Hello, friends. I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 28 and onward. We're right in the middle of our All In series where we've been looking and focusing in on what does it mean to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and today we come to strength. When Jesus gave this commandment, he was not giving us something new. Rather, he was repeating something old. He was expanding on the, an Old Testament commandment that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that was foundational for the people of God. And the focus of our series has been on this call to love God with all that we've got, every part of us. But have you noticed that there are actually two commandments in Deuteronomy 6? For years, I miss this, and I'm not sure how. There is a commandment before the commandment that we tend to skip right past. It's the commandment to listen. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all you've got. And we jump right to the love part. This commandment is known as the Shema because that's the Hebrew word that is interpreted here at the very beginning and we see it as hear. Shema is hear. It's an imperative verb. We are being commanded to listen. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes that there is not a fully accurate English word for Shema because it means more than just to hear It means to be alert, to be attentive, to be watchful, to listen, and ultimately to obey. Christianity is a very talky faith. We love to talk, 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 but we're not so quick and ready to listen. In fact, God's biggest complaint in the Old Testament against his people, and in fact, you can do a little study of this yourself, the thing that God complains the most about when it comes to his people is the fact that they do not listen to me, God says. They don't listen. And parents, you can identify with God on this one. Love listens. Perhaps the most loving thing that you can do for others, for our friends, for our children, for our parents, for others in the family of God, in the church, and yes, for God too, is to simply listen. What would it mean for you to become a listening person and for us to become a listening church? So in obedience to the first commandment, As we come to God's word today, first and foremost, let us shema, let us listen to what God might be saying to us. And let's pray together. Jesus, you are the living word. Speak to us today. Open our ears that we might hear the truth of the scriptures. Open our eyes that we might see maybe what we've never seen before. And most of all, open our hearts that we might sense the prompting of the Spirit and respond with faith and follow you. Help us to listen, that we might learn to live in the way of love. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28, we read these words. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. 
In this series, we've been asking you to go all in in following Jesus and in being part of God's family, the church. And that phrase, all in, is actually a cultural expression that means to be totally committed. In sports, if an athlete is all in, it means that they're giving themselves completely to the point of absolute exhaustion. In politics, if a candidate is all in, it means that they're putting all of their resources, their reputation, perhaps even their future career on the line in support of a specific cause or position. And while there are many scenarios for all in in our culture, the the, the term actually originates from the game of poker. It refers to that moment when a player, whether out of bravado, recklessness, or desperation, bets all their chips on a single hand. Being all in is a choice based on what you believe you have in your hand and what you think you could win to wager all you've got for the chance to win the prize. And there's no holding back. And there's no going back. If you choose wrong, disaster. If you choose correct, victory. And it's the best thing you could have done. And that begins to give us a sense and to illustrate what Jesus is inviting us to here when it comes to following him and living life in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, if you're really going to discover your God-given calling, if you're going to take hold of, of life in the kingdom of God and experience life to the full in your relationship with God, it begins with an all-in commitment to love God with all you've got. Now, don't miss here. God isn't just after your work or your money or your contribution. He's not trying to get something from you or use you. God doesn't actually need you. He wants you. First and foremost, God wants to love you. And he wants you to receive that love and then learn to live in that love and return that love to him. Because when that happens, faith moves from being an intellectual belief to a personal encounter. It results in a deepening, ongoing friendship with God and partnership in the work of the kingdom. And that's what God wants for you and me. And that's why Jesus says to the man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. It's right here in these words. So what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength? Let me review and go over where we've been so far. Three weeks ago, we saw that to love God with all your heart means that you love God passionately with your emotions. It's like how someone might love their spouse wholeheartedly. Even when you don't understand all his ways, we love God with a heart that says, yes, I will follow you. I will trust you. Even when we feel a little distraught or confused, we love him by saying, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. In week two, we saw that to love God with all your soul means to love God deeply with your will. In loving him, we love him by bringing our desires and our decisions in alignment with his expressed will and purpose for our lives. This is a longing obedience and a desire to be in his presence because the Lord is the only one who can satisfy our souls completely. Psalm 42 reflects this kind of love when it says, I thirst for God, for the living God. Where can I go and stand before him? Then last week we saw that to love the Lord with all your mind means to love God rationally with our thinking. This is about loving God by turning our thoughts to him, studying his word, thinking deeply about um, the, the truth and the application. It's about pondering who he is and what he has done and reflecting on his ways. Psalm 63 says, I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. And today we come to strength, which is an invitation to love God practically with our actions. It's about rolling up our sleeves and making a helpful contribution. It's about loving God with faithful perseverance. It's about going the extra mile and doing the good thing that nobody else sees. It's about hanging in there when fatigue and frustration creeps in. And it's it's about serving God as an act of love. And finally, the doers say, Amen. 
Now, each one of us will be drawn more naturally to one of these ways of loving God. Think about this, maybe in the context of love languages. How do you show love to God? God shapes each one of us differently. You may be a feeler or a discerner or a thinker or a doer. If you know someone who loves God most easily through their emotions, you will notice that on their face there always seems to be smiles or tears. They carry both joy and ache in their hearts. If you know someone who loves God deeply with their soul, they will prioritize spending time in prayer. They love being on retreat and thinking deeply about God, discerning his will and his way. If you know someone who loves God most easily in their thinking, you will notice that they always seem to have a book in their hand. They love to study and listen to podcasts and ponder ideas about God and get into conversation about the nature of God and theology. If you know someone who's a doer, that's someone who loves God through their actions. They will always be the first one to have their hands up, their sleeves rolled up. These are the ones who get the job done, who organize the schedule, set up the chairs, cook the meal, host the group, get the supplies, and serve wherever the need is greatest. They love God with their actions. They love God practically. What way do you most naturally show your love for God? Is it with your heart, soul, mind, or strength? The truth is that God wants us to mature in all these areas. Thinkers need to learn to feel. Doers need to learn to slow down and ponder. Feelers need to think clearly. And all of us need to serve. Today we focus on loving God with all our strength. Now this may not be the most natural way you're wired, but keep your heart and your soul and your mind open to what God might be saying to you. Because this might be exactly the place where God is saying to you, love me this way. The word used here for strength in Hebrew literally means might or muchness, to love God with all your muchness. It's about loving God with your abilities, with your substance, with your time, with your possessions, the, that best of, the best of all that God has given to you. This is about loving God with excellence and doing our very best and giving him what we value most, but for the right reasons. In Luke 18, Jesus speaks to a man who had lived a moral life and who had kept all the commandments, no murders, no idolatry, no stealing. He even cared for his parents. He thought he had kept the law perfectly, but he missed out on the whole point of the law, which is to love God with all your might, with all your strength, with all your muchness. So when Jesus told him to take action and go and sell his possessions and give the money to the poor, the man went away sad because he loved God just not that much. Think about it when you, when you go up to a young child and you say to them, show me your muscles. What do they do? Show me your muscles. Do it right now. Show me your muscles. That's the point. It's cute and it's fun. It's the big flex. Now, what's the purpose? You can stop it. You can stop doing it now. But what's the purpose of showing you my muscles? It's to show you how strong I am. And the reason we have muscles is to help us do things, to help us move. And when we love God with all our strength, we use our bodies. We get ourselves into it physically. We use our resources and our abilities, our muchness to accomplish for God, things for God and to do things with God. This is all about practical serving. Loving God by taking action. The word strength has to do with action. It's movement. It's loving God by the way we serve. It's learning to love God and to realize that God actually has a love language too. And one of his love languages is acts of service. And when we love each other and when we serve in the community and when we serve in the church and in the world, we are loving God. And one of the ways that we can express our love and devotion to God is through acts of service. That's how we express our faith in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Do it with muchness. Do it with all your strength. 
Those who love God this way are energetic activists. They're the achievers, the accomplishers, the workers. They push things forward. They, they help things happen in practical ways. And that is why they are so needed in the life of the church. Sometimes doers feel like they, they don't make a significant contribution because they aren't upfront leaders very often. But they have a huge purpose. They make a major contribution because without them, nothing happens. They are the engine of the church. They have initiative and energy and action, and they have this drive to accomplish the mission. And in a practical sense, they are the hands and feet of Jesus. And the natural implication of Jesus's words is that we all should be learning to serve each other and God in this way. So why don't people serve? Why are we always short on volunteers? Well, let me give you some suggestions, some excuses that we all generate for not serving. Number one, I didn't know there was a need. After all, things seem to be running pretty well. And I'm new here. I didn't know there was a place that I could serve where I was needed. Besides, don't we have staff to run things like this? Each one of us is called to serve in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, look, the fields are ripe unto harvest, but the workers are few. God is inviting us to join the harvest and to learn to serve. So find out what the practical needs are and get involved. There's areas all over our church community to serve, whether it's in Compass Kids or Compass Students, in hospitality or greeting or on the prayer team, in home groups, on our care team, the move team, newcomers, worship, tech, maintenance, tellering, there is a place for you to serve practically. And if you want to find out more about this or get involved, then I encourage you to go to our website, www.thisiscompass.com, and under the Next Steps tab, you will see a thing that says Compass Teams. When you click on that, there's a whole list of ministries there, and you can actually decide where you would like to be involved or what you'd like to find out more about. You may see something that interests you or you may have another idea. Just leave us your contact information and your area of interest and we will work with you to get you plugged in to an area and a place that works best for you. Excuse number two, I don't think I'm capable. I don't think I have anything great to offer. In fact, I feel inadequate that I'm not qualified because I've never done this ministry before. I didn't go to seminary. In fact, sometimes I even have doubts about my faith. And sometimes I mess up. I sin. And I have so much to learn. If this is your excuse, listen. God is way more concerned about your attitude and your availability than your skill and ability. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. The truth of God's word is that he has gifted you with spiritual gifts and probably more than one. In fact, in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, and in Ephesians 4, there's a whole list of spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives out to the believers within the church. And just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a specific function, so the gifts within the church allow us to function together. We have many parts, many gifts, but one body, and we all belong together. And as we serve together using our gifts, the body functions well. The body grows healthy and strong. God has given you a spiritual gift, and he's given me a spiritual gift. And our job is to figure out what those gifts are and then learn how to use them in the service of God and others. God's also given you natural talents and abilities that can also be used in and through the church. You are capable because God is with you and God has in, equipped you and he will empower you to do what he's called you to do. And the way you develop those gifts is by getting involved. A third reason you may not be serving is that, you've, that you say, you know, I'm tired. I've done my part. And this is real. People are tired. You would think that after two and a half years of COVID, people would be raring to go, but we're not. People are stressed, perhaps burned out. 
And serving just seems like one more thing on top of the pile. Others have said, you know, I've served in the past and now it's time for someone else to do it. If this is where you are, let me just gently suggest that you might be cutting the very thing that could be give, restore you and give you new life. Because when you serve God, he is with you. He draws near and he empowers you to accomplish the task. And you get drawn into relationship not only with God, but with others. And not only does the church get strengthened and renewed, but so do you. I want to be like Caleb in the Old Testament. When he was old, after years of serving and, and, and following after God, he's still saying, God, do you have anything else for me to accomplish today? Is it prayer? I'll pray. Is it encouragement? I'll encourage. Is there a place that I can give my time or my treasure? I'll give. Caleb says, are there any more giants in the land that we still need to take down? Count me in, God. Send me. And maybe you are tired because you've been injured or insulted by others or disappointed by the church. Maybe you feel confused or frustrated and it's caused you to pull back in your service and in your giving. I'm telling you, don't let the enemy sideline you. Don't let him do it. That's what he's seeking to do. Seek healing. Pursue restoration. Practice forgiveness. Be honest about the hurt and the challenge and figure out and have those conversations about the way things are and how you see them. Enter into that kind of dialogue, but don't let your disappointment keep you from serving God. Don't let bitterness take root and become a barrier. Have healthy, honest, God-honoring conversations. Bring it all to God and find some wise, trusted voices. Pray. But keep serving. It honors God and it will keep your faith healthy and strong. Now, those are just a few suggestions. And you might have a whole other list that you could do. In fact, one of the things you could do in your home group is to talk about the reasons people don't serve. But don't stay there too long. In fact, I think our primary focus needs to be on the reasons why we should serve. And the first, I think, is this. Quite simply, God has things for us to do. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece, his special possessions, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One of the reasons God has saved you is so that he could lovingly work through you to build up the church and extend the kingdom. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are shaped to serve. God has work for you to do, not just good intentions or good thoughts or good ideas or good words, good works. God calls his people to love him with all their strength and by doing good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. Reason number two, serving activates my faith. The book of 1 John is all about loving God and loving God's church. And in chapter 3, verse 18, it says this, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let me just read that again slowly. Dear children, let us lo not love with words or speech. Now pause right there. Isn't it wonderful to have somebody say loving words about us? Maybe they're making a speech at a birthday party or they're posting something nice on social media or maybe it's a card you get on your anniversary or a note you get at work. And it's nice to hear those things, but if there aren't any actions that follow up with those words, they begin to ring a little hollow. But isn't that what we do to God so often? We praise him and we say all sorts of incredible things about God, but when there's an opportunity to serve, we sit on our hands. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren writes, Worship is far more than, than praising, singing, and praying to God. Worship is a lifestyle of enjoying God, loving Him, and giving ourselves to be used for His purposes. That's an echo of Paul's words that say, Let us not love just with words, but with actions 
actions that ring true. A true actions means doing something, loving God practically. And it's wrapped up in that word service. And sideline service is not an option for the Christian. Author Bob Goff, in his incredible book, Love Does, says it this way, love is never stationary. In the end, love doesn't just keep thinking about it or keep planning for it. Simply put, love does. And Jesus invites his followers to become active in their faith by, in, by getting involved in the service of the kingdom. There is no place that scripture lends itself to the idea that it's okay to be a Christian and just sit on the sidelines while others do the work. Loving God with all your strength means loving him by serving and not just and it's not just simply reserved for the few, for the exceptionally gifted or for the professionals. It's for every believer, every follower of Jesus. Third, we're motivated to serve because Jesus shows us how. He sets the example. He shows us the way. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served. He fed hungry people. He came alongside hurting people. He befriended lonely people. He listened to lost people. He washed the feet of stinky people. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, the only one on earth who was completely pure and sinless. And he is the one who is worthy of worship and service. And yet he comes and he loves God and he loves others by becoming a servant himself. Jesus served and he sets us an example to follow. In Matthew 20, 26, it says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the foundation. That's the heartbeat of our faith. A Savior who served, who sacrificed, who gave his life because he loved God with all his strength. He loved God and was willing to sacrifice all to give his life, to do it practically with his muchness and with his might. And I want to encourage and challenge you to start living beyond yourself and to find somewhere that you can, can pour your life and your gifts and your abilities into the church and into the kingdom of God in practical ways by serving others. Can you imagine a church where people, say, instead of saying, what's in it for me, said, where can I be of help? And if you want to go there, let's talk. Let's encourage one another. Let's get involved. Maybe you need to find a ministry leader or a staff person or come and talk to me. We'd love to help you find a place to serve based on your passion, your giftings and abilities. Can you imagine a church where the attitude isn't it's all about me, but instead it's all about God and others and his kingdom. I'm just here to do my part. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think it's a church that Jesus would love. And where we would love God by mirroring the attitude of Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve. That can be you. That can be me. And together we will love God with all our strength. Let's pray together. I want to give you just a moment now in the quiet to listen. To think back over the service and over the message and ask, God, what are you saying to me? Where are you nudging me? What might you be inviting me to? Is there an excuse that's been keeping me from serving? Can you surrender that to God? Is there a commitment you need to make? Just take a moment now and listen. Lord, you are so amazing and wonderful. You have loved us into existence and into eternal life. 
And we want to love you back with all we have. We want to love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And in response to the muchness that you have given to us, we want to return that love to you. And I pray that you would empower us to serve you with perseverance and with passion. Give us eyes for the harvest field and compassion for those in need. Show us how we have been shaped to serve. Restore and heal those who've been injured. Protect especially those of us who are doers from overwork, busyness, burnout, and from the temptation to do things in our own strength. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to learn to serve you and others with a strength that comes from you. Not out of a sense of guilt, but motivated by pure love. May we not just praise you with our words, but may we be people of godly action. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned.